Let's take a look at this model of the brain stem, and in particular, we're going to look at the anterior region. Um, let's take a look first at the medulla oblongata. So here's the medulla oblongata here from the pons. And of course, this will ultimately become the brain stem after it leaves the foramen magnum. Here are the olives of the medulla oblongata. And the olives, of course, are there to essentially register muscle tone and stretch of muscle. The pons itself is probably the most obvious feature. Pons communicates with the cerebellum as well as having some respiratory centers for regulation. It also has some ponti nuclei that we will talk about a little bit later. Now, in the midbrain region, we have the cerebral peduncles, which are quite obvious. So let's take a look now at perhaps some of the cranial nerves. And we don't actually have the olfactory nerve on this model, so I'm going to actually start with cranial nerve number two. So this is cranial nerve number two, which is the optic nerve. And of course, this X is the optic chiasma. Sometimes people call this the optic chiasmata. This little stalk coming down from the hypothalamus is called the infundibulum. And at the end of the stalk would rest the pituitary gland. Now, these little nerves here are the ocular motor nerves, which of course control eye movement. So that's nerve number three. And then we have the trochlear nerves. These are very fine nerves, which innervate the superior oblique muscle. And again, this is for eye movement, particularly moving the eye downward. This is the trigeminal nerve here and here. And the trigeminal nerve is called trigeminal because it is three twins. Um, there is an ophthalmic branch for the skin of the forehead for sense of touch, a maxillary branch for the skin of the upper jaw, and a mandibular branch, which not only is for the skin of the lower jaw, but also for the chewing muscles, uh, in particular the masseter muscle and the temporalis muscle. Now here is the abducens nerve. This again regulatory for eye movement. And uh, this one actually is for the lateral rectus muscles, muscle, which helps pull the eye uh, more laterally. This nerve is going to be the facial nerve, typically a double-barreled nerve. And that's for facial expression, taste, and tears, followed by the vestibulocochlear nerve, which is the nerve for hearing and balance. So as I work our way down to the uh, medulla oblongata, we see the glossopharyngeal nerve. This is for an, a nerve for bitter taste, for gagging, and for gases. So put the G's together. Glossopharyngeal, gagging, and gases. Glosso meaning tongue, pharyngeal referring to the throat. The big nerve here behind the olive is the vagus nerve. This is the wandering nerve that innervates the major organs of the thoracic and abdominal cavities. And then down here is the accessory nerve. Accessory nerve innervates muscles of the neck and shoulder. A couple examples would be sternocleidomastoid and the trapezius. And finally, we bounce back up here, medial to the olive, with the hypoglossal nerve, and that is the nerve for the tongue. Here is again the medulla oblongata, and something I want to point out to you is the pyramid. Crossing over or decussation occurs in the pyramids. So axons that are traveling up or down from the brain uh, or to the brain, afferent or afferent travels up, efferent or efferent travel down. The correct way to pronounce it is afferent or efferent. Let's take a look now. Those cross in the pyramids in a process called decussation. So for example, if we have axons traveling up this way, they cross over here to this side. And if we have axons traveling, say, this way, they would cross over here to this side, right? Again, this process is called decussation. This is a great model of the ventricles of the brain. Uh, the ventricles of the brain, of course, house cerebral spinal fluid. And they also uh, produce cerebral spinal fluid because they contain choroid plexuses. Now, this pink area is a choroid plexus, as is this area here. And, of course, pink area here and a pink area here. 
So we're associating all these ventricles with choroid plexes, plexuses, which of course is where cerebral spinal fluid is made. Look at this large C-shaped ventricle, and that is referred to as the lateral ventricle. And as you might guess, there's two lateral ventricles because there are two hemispheres of the brain. If you take a look down here, we see that the lateral ventricles connect with the third ventricle via the interventricular foramen. And so this third ventricle is actually the region of the thalamus and hypothalamus. Thalamus would be here, hypothalamus would be here. In a previous video, I talked about the face of the bird, right? So here is the face of the bird. The eye of the bird, of course, would be this hole, which would actually be a place where tissue would reside, and that would be the intermediate mass or interthalamic adhesion. The beak of the bird is the hypothalamus, again, all part of the third ventricle. You come down here, and this sort of neck of the bird is the cerebral aqueduct, which connects to this little squatty body of the bird, and that is the fourth ventricle. So there's four ventricles that we see on this particular model.